Okay, well, good morning. I'm Susan Allen, a faculty here at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. Welcome to the very first session of our Fall Peace Week. The theme this, this year, this fall, is Rethinking Peace 2022 and Beyond. And I am really thrilled to be able to start this session, uh, start this week with, with a session that I've been very much looking forward to. Uh, between the margins of Congo and Rwanda, repression, discourse, and regional power. We have two excellent speakers uh, ready to engage in discussion with each other and with, with all of us. Um, before we get started, I want to note that this is a recorded session, um, and we will be recording this and, and saving the event so that others can, can um, enjoy the, the recording in the future. Uh, the, the session focuses, uh, as I mentioned, on between the margins of Congo and Rwanda, repression, discourse, and regional power. Uh, our two speakers are Claudine Kurodusinge McLeod, who is originally from Rwanda and is the chair of the Ethics, Peace, and Human Rights Master's Program at American University. She's also a human rights activist and scholar specializing in genocide studies and in the intersection of diaspora consciousness and social mobilization. She's the author of Narratives of Victimhood and Perpetration, The Struggle of Bosnian and Rwandan Diaspora Communities in the United States, as well as many articles published uh, in various uh, journals. Uh, she, I am proud to say, she received her master's and her PhD from the Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution here at George Mason University. So it's always a pleasure to welcome back an alumna uh, to speak during a Peace Week presentation. Thank you for joining us. And then also really thrilled to, to welcome uh, Dr. Christopher Davey uh, from Clark University. Uh, he is the uh, Charles E. Scheidt Visiting Assistant Professor of Genocide Studies and Genocide Prevention at the Strasser Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. He teaches genocide and civil war in the African Great Lakes region and genocide prevention and his research explores the connections of genocide across the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda and contemporary perspectives on genocide from identity to diaspora mobilizations of genocide and climate related violence. Uh, he's also a board member and project lead for education for global peace and he received his PhD from University of Bradford in peace studies. Um, so over to, to, to you, Dr. Uh, Karuda Singe McLeod and, and Dr. Davey, we'll, we'll start with uh, Dr. Karuda Singe McLeod. Thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Thank you, Susan. It's always a pleasure to be back at the Carter School. Um, what I want to do first is kind of set a scene and then I'm going to invite uh, Chris uh, um, to make, uh, to give some remark and then I'll actually come back later. Um, the scene I want to kind of set up is based on different conversations and different uh, themes of this conversation um, and kind of talks about narrative and narrative creation. Um, in order to understand the, the broader context of Rwanda with the neighboring countries where Rwanda also is diaspora, we have to understand how Rwanda came in terms of like the, the different narrative that came about in Rwanda. One thing we need to understand is that Rwanda as a country and the different ethnicity and ethnic identity within Rwanda have a different understanding of where they come from and what the history of both their country, but also their people is. Um, if you were to look at the history right now, the history promoted and starts in Rwanda, you, the history will talk about ethnic identity in the sense of being constructed by Belgium. And before Belgium, the ethnic identities were not a thing. They were social class where the, if you were wealthy, you were a Tutsi, and if you were less wealthy, uh, you were a Hutu, but like, that will change based on your status. And um, for the, the Hutu communities, that is not a real history. So we already understand that those two ethnic identities are understanding the origin story is completely different. And that is due in some ways because of not having accurate uh, pre-colonial writing that kind of talks about the history from the different perspectives, but also based on how narrative has been weaponized to promote specific agenda, to, um, to create an intense, um, to create intense division between the different ethnic groups. Um, as I said, for the Hutu 
the, the story is different. So the Hutus, they were ethnic identity already before uh, colonialism. Uh, if you look at the difference between both stories and you look at that before colonialism, um, you see that on one hand, the, the, the Tutsi believes, or at least promote the idea of um, kingship and everybody was kind of happy under the king um, rules and everybody was fine. But if you look at the way Hutu have constructed the narrative, they, there was violence within that kingship. They don't agree on what the situation between both groups was before. And fast forwarding, three, four centuries later, now we're having two different communities living together in one specific country, Rwanda, but also in Burundi, which is another story, but in one specific country, and they do not agree on where they come from. Um, and if they don't agree on where they come from, then the, the narrative that is being promoted as the history of the country on itself is already creating tension. And that narrative has been promoted and has been weaponized um, both to, in some ways, justify the genocide, where one group uh, was saying, hey, you guys have always oppressed us because of this narrative we have in our past. And then you have the other one after the genocide saying this narrative that you all have promoted for so long, it is not real. It is constructed by the Belgian. It is not a real narrative. And because of that, then we have to, to break down all those social fabrics we've had for so long in Rwanda and we are creating new ones that, that fit um, the construction of a narrative we want to promote right now in order to bring unity in some ways, but also in order to make sure that we have the power over the country. So the creation of those two narratives has in some ways led to a lot of the issues because um, those two narratives are really at the basis of how they see themselves in terms of identity. And for those who are identity, social identity uh, fan like me and I'm, a, and I'm a single like Chris, this notion of social identity is social constructed, but it is real and experienced and leads to violence. Um, so I kind of wanted to like establish that as a background to um, some of the, the comments Chris is gonna give and then I will pick that up and then kind of talk more about how that looks like more currently then. Chris? Thanks, Claudine, and thanks for the introduction, Susan. It's great to be here with you all. So, yeah, I really appreciated what uh, Claudine had to say there, and it's, it's important to set that scene. And a lot of my research actually then looks at the fallout of that weaponization of uh, narratives, but then also how those divided narratives have impacted life across the border into Zaire, Democratic Republic of Congo. Most of my work uh, focuses on the uh, Congolese Tutsi uh, group in South Kivu, uh, self-described as Banyu Malenge. And this is a really interesting case study for us to see how these narratives became integral to politics on the other side of the border in Congo from Rwanda. And the, the thing that I have sort of been investigating over the last several years is the involvement and participation of uh, Congolese Tutsi. Uh, particularly again in, in South Kivu, um, is their participation and involvement in the Rwandan Patriotic Front as they joined the movement in the early part of the Civil War in the 19, early 1990s, and then continued to join uh, during the genocide in 1994 and then afterwards as well. And this is really interesting because we get to see here the absorption and impact of this uh, highly highly organized and specifically constructed narrative that the Rwandan Patriotic Front um, started to tell itself as part of its military training and then as part of its formation or the formation of the state from 1994 onwards. So these uh, Banya Malenge um, uh, soldiers uh, joined uh, through uh, Rwandan Patriotic Front recruitment networks, you know, from, again, as I said, 1990 through, you know, through 1991 and uh, into 1996 as well. And they received this training, this uh, understanding of you know, what the Belgians did, right? So this, they received this sort of colonial centered narrative. And then also this uh, narrative that 
uh, very much justified and was focused on providing security for Tutsis regionally, and this included Tutsi populations in uh, Eastern Congo. And so, sort of make a, a long story short, this population has been involved and has been part of the, the fallout of this narrative across the border. And whilst there's much history in between, we can see this reverberating today still in the North Kivu area and, um, and also in South Kivu as well, where whilst Banyamelenge populations aren't as necessarily allied anymore with the Rwandan Patriotic Front, they've become disenchanted with this narrative, but have inherited ways of telling the story much as the RPF uh, did in that 1990s period. However, we see a continuance of this, you know, this weaponized narrative, right, this need to protect uh, Tutsis at all costs, uh, ongoing today in North Kivu with the resurgence of M23, and whilst um, fighting has perhaps been somewhat paused during uh, US diplomacy and more importantly, regional diplomacy, there's still very much a sense of how memory and narrative are um, in some ways driving conflict, but then also the general instability within which Rwanda has had a hand, as not solely to blame, but has had a hand in perpetuating over the last couple of decades. And so I'm very much you know, interested for us to keep talking here and think about you know, this creation of these narratives and the identities that they've created aren't necessarily solely about who is a victim and who is a perpetrator, because when we look at these histories, and as Claudine talked about, and, and as we'll hopefully get to discuss soon, as she mentions in her book, these two identities, when they're represented in simplified ways, do us a disservice as researchers and as uh, observers of um, common you know, political and public discourse in Rwanda and Congo, and in perhaps uh, Burundi as well. And so, Part of both of, if I may, what both of our work, um, what we try to do uh, separately here is to challenge these notions of a uh, victim and perpetrator and try to think more critically about how they are layered, constructed over time, and layered in the sense that you could have a particular group, whether it be you know, Tutsis returning from Uganda as part of the Rwandan Patriotic Front or Tutsis in uh, South Kivu in Eastern Congo, who have been involved as uh, victims and perpetrators over their, the period of them being involved in conflict since the early 1990s. Um, so perhaps I can leave it there. There's more to say, but I'll pass back over to you. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we need to know and remember about Rwanda is that today's victims are going to be tomorrow's perpetrator and that is something that is has been cyclical in rwanda like rwanda has never been a democracy and it's still not a democracy those who were victim during colonialism ended up committing a lot of atrocity after that and those who were victim during the genocide are currently committing atrocities like i got text messages a couple of days ago about literally three kids getting like being taken by the police and just disappearing. We haven't heard from them in a few, few days. So th this idea of today's victim that tomorrow is tomorrow perpetrator is real in the construction of Rwandan politics. And that is created through different narratives and identities. Two things I wanna focus on. Um, as Chris mentioned, most of his work has been kind of looking at, uh, uh, at Banya Murenge, uh, which are uh, from the Tutsi ethnic identity. My work started actually by looking at Hutus and Hutus in Belgium. And my, my interest there was to kind of understand from the second generation, those who were born right before the genocide or those who were born in between the first five years of and after the genocide, try to understand what it meant to be Hutu. And the reason why was because President Kagame uh, had given a speech where he was saying that all the Hutus need to apologize for the crimes of genocide, including those who were born after. And that kind of created a reaction among Rwandans in general, but mostly among Hutus. And I was interested in that first generation after the genocide and understanding what it meant to be Hutu, what it meant to be Rwandans and how they in some ways embodied those different identities within their own stories, within their own narrative. 
and it was interesting how this notion of victimhood was as present in their life as the notion of victimhood we associate to treaties during the genocide. The, the, they were not victims of the same fact, but they were victims in a lot of different ways. Uh, the first, they were victims of crimes that were, com that were committed that were not their own crimes, but they had to embody them and they had to in some ways justify themselves and like excuse themselves for things they had never committed. Um, they were victims because we have to admit that we had Hutus dying during the genocide. We don't talk about it. It's not necessarily something we've been acknowledging, especially lately. The, the label of um, moderate Hutus was kind of dropped uh, several years after the genocide. So we had Hutus who died during the genocide. We had Hutus who protected Tutsis that were not acknowledged. So they also had that sense of victimhood of them not being acknowledged and them have, they had lost family members and they were victims in some capacity. And then most importantly, they, see, they saw themselves as victims of the narrative of the genocide because that, that narrative was in some ways like a, like a skin they had to, to, to carry all the time because one genocide is known by everybody. Um, so every time, they were introducing themselves and they were like, I'm from Rwanda. The first question was like, are you a victim or are you a perpetrator? And just imagine an 18 year old, that's a question everybody asked him. So those were interesting um, and those were extremely problematic and traumatic for them. So you did see like a level of trauma that came from the genocide that wasn't at the same as the Tutsi one. And then from that work, I moved into looking at the Rwandan community as, uh, as a, broader, a broader kind of understanding. And I looked at Hutus, Tutsis, and Kwa. Interestingly, um, and I think that is something that that's kind of stayed with me, we never acknowledge the third identity. We have three ethnic groups in you know, in Rwanda. The Kwa is never part of the conversation. And in my conversation with, um, several Twa I was able to meet, they felt like they had the, 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 the most important victim identity in some ways. They were the, the real victim because they were in Rwanda when the genocide happened, which means they also suffer, but they were literally ignored from every single thing. Uh, we even constructed every single narrative, every single policy. And Rwanda don't really have policies to address the Twa. Um, so they had a sense of victimhood that was different. So if you look at all three identities, all three had a different sense of victimhood that was completely different based on completely different things. But the, the common uh, denominator was narrative, how the construction of the Rwandan genocide narrative had in some ways been extremely harmful. But that narrative in some ways had allowed Western countries to pull financial and humanitarian aid in Rwanda. We created our ad hoc tribunal. We created the ICC based on some of the facts that had happened in Rwanda. So the international community was able to, in some ways, take what had happened and create an entire new structure where the Rwandans themselves are still currently experiencing the, the trauma of something that happened over, over 28, 29 years ago. So it is extremely fascinating to see that. And I think the last thing I want to kind of touch on, and that's something Chris also mentioned, is this, by the creation of the narrative, by creating specific restricted stories, then what we need to do is to make sure that everybody tells the same story, right? So those who don't want to tell the same story or don't accept that story, then they need to be silenced. So Rwanda is one of the most repressive countries, both in the homeland, in the neighboring country, but also in the diaspora. Rwanda has an amazing mechanism to silence anyone that has a different story. From um, poisoning, we had people getting poisoned. We had people disappearing. We had people being killed in different countries. Like for example, in South Africa, we had several Rwandans who were killed in South Africa. And Rwanda is currently using Pegasus on the loudest voices. Pegasus is a cyber 
it's a, it's a hacking device um, created by an Israeli company where at the second it's on your, uh, in your phone, that's it, have control over everything, both your personal life, people you talk to, uh, people who interact, they literally have your entire life. Rwanda has been using that on several people. And most importantly, we have people like Paul, who um, is the author of the Hotel Rwanda movie and book, who got kidnapped and ended up in Rwanda without knowing why he was there. And now he's in prison for about 15 years. So Rwanda has been extremely uh, good at creating a specific story that's been promoted everywhere and accepted everywhere. And it's also been extremely, really good at making sure that those who didn't agree with that story uh, have experienced hardship, have in some ways disappeared and several have died because they in some ways challenged the story. So it is dangerous <laughs> in a lot of ways to not promote a London story. Um, and um, I, I'm gonna stop there because I feel like I kind of throw a lot of information and I feel like we have so much to talk about. So I'm gonna stop here. Let's see if we have any questions. If not, I always have questions. You can ask my students. I always, always have questions for people. <laughs> Perhaps I could just throw in a little bit more um, before we open up for questions, if that's okay. Um, just to add briefly, you know, the, the point that's being made here about uh, Rwandan involvement and its policies, but then also perhaps what we might call more subversive work uh, within the region and within its own diaspora is felt by um, Congolese populations. So I you know, do work you know, regionally um, looking at and sort of talking with members of the Banyamulenge and uh, diaspora within the region. And they have, as a, uh, many voices within the group have spoken out against you know, uh, Rwanda, right, in, in various ways. Um, and I think I've come across lots of sort of anecdotal cases where, uh, you know, individuals, prominent individuals, you know, lawyers, public figures within the Banya Malinga communities have uh, spoken out against Rwanda and have, you know, been impacted negatively, have experienced violence and have disappeared, right? And obviously, you know, there is an absence of robust uh, investigation, as there often is in these cases, to actually figure out what happened. Uh, to these people, but there is a, a sense of speaking out against Rwanda is, is negatively punished. And this reveals some of the complexities of what's been happening in, in Eastern Congo. Um, just to briefly detail this, uh, and I'll make one other point and then stop. D to briefly detail, um, one of the, or a Burundian rebel group, Red Tabara, which is in South Kivu, uh, is sort of an anti-regime group. Uh, that is uh, anti-Burundian regime group that is sort of uh, harboring itself in Eastern Congo and South Kivu. Uh, in the last few years, this group has been uh, trained and supplied with weapons by, um, by the Rwandan government. This has been documented by the UN group of experts and others. And this group has been targeting, uh, along with the sort of multi-directional uh, conflict, a uh, low-scale conflict in South Kivu, targeting Banyamalenge uh, communities and the representative armed groups. And so you know, Banyamalenge, who were once allied uh, and sort of in part of this storytelling of uh, the Rwandan uh, Patriarch Front in particular is perpetuated, are now, you know, seeing this uh, sort of backlash of uh, indirect backlash as a result of Rwandan um, engagement in the region, right? And so then when Banyamalenge lawyers speak out against Red Tabara saying and, you know, assigning blame to Kigali, this then has negative impact and consequence, um, you know, causing, you know, violence and, you know, rumors of, um, again, this sort of subversive uh, kind of targeting of individuals. The last thing I'll, I'll mention, and um, just about some of my other recent work, which kind of ties into this, uh, last August was the anniversary of the Gutumba massacre of Banyamalenge refugees and others in a refugee camp just across the Burundian border in 2004. So a UN protected camp, uh, again, Burundian uh, rebels uh, allied with uh, other Congolese groups, uh, recruiting from potentially as well the uh, FDLR, uh, entered into this refugee camp and killed 166 um, Banyamalenge refugees. Now, there's 
again, layers of complexity in this sort of multi-directional nature of the conflict here. But I've been uh, investigating and researching, uh, understanding the narratives of the impact of this event. And whilst on surface value, it provides to us uh, accounts of victimhood, which are important for us to document, understand, it also presents to us, this, again, the sort of multi-layered and um, multi-directional um, more nuanced story of what's been happening in the region for the last couple of decades. And it's important for us to grasp that level of the story in order to really understand you know, what's going on. So say, for example, we have recently, as a result of uh, M23 incursions, which are again, responsible by the Rwanda government, we have an uptick and spike in anti-Tutsi rhetoric and hate speech. And this is very observable and has been documented. There's a recent article in the Journal of Genocide Research which talks about this. However, as documentable as it is, it is still a, a surface level of what is happening, right? We need to dig down deeper and understand where these narratives come from and why they're mobilized by po politicians, particularly in Congo, to you know, drive anti-Tutsi sentiment, right? So you have these you know, various factors which, you know, again, if taken at face value, don't help us um, resolve conflicts in the long term or address you know, the needs of peace building in the region. So I'll stop there. And yes, we should see if we have some questions. Stella, you have a question for us? Yeah. Um, so for a little bit of context, over the summer, um, I got to visit Rwanda with the Shar School. And so I guess I got, um, and we got to talk with a lot of government officials. So I kind of got the official, like Rwandan perspective, like Kigali perspective on um, different things that are happening. And um, the perspective that was shared there a lot was that um, any, like we, we uh, were able, we brought up a lot of questions in our discussions. And one of the things that we brought up were limitations on freedom of speech or limitations of the media. And the answer that we got was that yes, um, the Rwandan government um, does monitor the media and put some limitations, um, but that that is essential to preventing um, genocide from happening in the future because um, hate speech was a leading cause of genocide. And um, within the like the narrative promoted by the government, they pretty much were saying that all the current development efforts, everything that um, the Rwanda government is doing is to prevent um, a genocide from happening again and to promote um, unity. Um, and obviously this doesn't match up when you look at the people disappearing and the funding of certain groups. But while I was in the country um, and talking to like regular people, the people, it, regardless of um, being Hutu or Tutsi or people weren't even disclosing that, seemed to highly um, support the government and seem the, because the quality of life for the majority of people has vastly improved, it sounded like generally talking to like the bus driver and just regular people, people highly supported Kagame. Um, and so I guess my question is how it, it I, how do you take into account like that perspective of the people um, in Rwanda whose life has greatly improved while still looking at like diaspora perspectives and also um, like taking a more objective view of what the Rwandan government is doing and not letting its citizens know? So you touched on several things. Right. Um, the first thing we need to acknowledge is that um, the current RPF is the most successful diaspora community. And the reason why I'm saying that is diaspora community usually do not go back home. They are established, they are, they are comfortable in the country they live in. So 
in in a sense, the 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 two two that went back home in their late 1980s and then 1990s during the genocide are, are a success story for diaspora to actually go back home and take over or become the, the, the primary leadership. Second thing, uh, in terms of the freedom of expression, uh, we need to contextualize it first. Um, yes, the radio, uh, Hadio Milkulin, was extremely influ like influential in the making of the genocide. Um, in the early 1990s, you only had the radio, like only rich people, like really wealthy people had a TV. So radio was the only channel for people to just listen, to communicate. Uh, so when you only have one like medium for communication, it is way easier to control people. It's way easier to manipulate specific narratives. So that is in some ways one of the reasons the, the radio was so influential in the making of the genocide. Fast forward to today, it's easy to take that example and be like, we have to restrict people's freedom of expression. Um, and we have cases um, where that is a little bit more problematic in the sense of one of the main um, artists who was the, the face of the post Rwanda reconciliation period, Kizito wrote a song talking about, hey, for true reconciliation in Rwanda, we have to acknowledge all the crimes. We have to acknowledge that we had brothers and sisters in the different ethnic identities that were killed. When that song came out, he disappeared, ended up in prison, and he was charged with um, negationism. So Rwanda has two laws that are extremely vaguely um, framed. And both of them lead to the same result, right? It's a negationist law. And that one says that if you say anything against the president or against the narrative promoted by Rwanda, that is you um, promoting genocide, which means you go to prison. And the other one is around those ethnic identities. If you talk about your ethnic identity, it's illegal. You go to prison, which kind of touch on one of your points about why people don't talk about the ethnic identity is because it's illegal. If they do it, they'll go to prison. So they don't openly say which ethnic identity they are from, but your name is an indicator. Like my name is an indicator of which ethnic identity I'm from. Um, and you can't erase that history in just 20 years. Um, especially if you're looking at the narrative of the genocide, the genocide as a genocide against Tutsi. So you can't erase identity and ethnic identities in the way they've been trying to do it. Um, going back to Kizito, um, you do have a lot of artists. You have a lot of uh, musicians, poets, who by the songs they're writing that were promoting reconciliation, they ended up getting in trouble because the reconciliation was not the one the running, the running government was promoting, right? And a lot of them ended up in prison. Uh, we have several that disappeared a couple of years ago. We still haven't heard from them. We are assuming that they are dead, but we still have not heard from them. Um, so these, um, the, the, the excuse given that they have to control the media um, in order for, for us to stop a genocide, I think it is kind of an easy excuse because at that time, you are controlling pretty much every single aspect of your of people's life. Um, and at that time, you are in some ways crystallizing your narrative and creating more harm than anything else. Um, I think you also had a point around how everybody kind of is okay with President Kagame, which, yeah, because they will die if they openly talk against him. Like you do have uh, several. Um, political parties that are oppositional to the current RPF, but they are vetted by the government. They receive money from the government for them to be able to function. And um, I remember when he got elected in 20, I think it was 2010, and then the next elections, a lot of people who were working for the other positions were wearing President Kagame's shirt they were supporting the current government, but they were working for the other opposition. And that was an indicator of there's no free elections. Everything is controlled by the government. So if you say something, then it's you putting yourself at risk. 
if a president is elected at 99%, um, that's an indication that it was not free and fair. People were not saying what they wanted to say. They were not free to, to make a decision. They knew the consequences of what will happen if we say anything else. Last point I want to make, when you go to Rwanda uh, for organized trips, like schools, work, often the people you talk to are vetted by the government. So the people you will meet are the, the, the scholars, the museums, um, workers and bus drivers, people you encounter are people that were selected. Um, so I often, I'm often more conscious when it comes to hearing the narrative when I go to, if I were to go to Rwanda to talk to people that I know were planned for me to talk to, because I know those people are not people I selected, but they were people that were selected for me to make sure that I get the official narrative because those who are not going to give me the official narrative are pretty much going to end up in prison or disappearing. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> and I'll just briefly add on, because that was definitely a question more for you than me, but I'd just briefly add on when I've been to Rwanda, just this very same thing, right? I mean, how you how your course is charted for you while visiting the country very much matters in terms of you know, the stories that you will hear. And, you know, it's important to, you know, when you're in someone else's country, at least from my perspective as a, as a white European, that I, you know, I'm there to hear the stories that are going to be told. However, I did not experience sort of, you know, honesty from uh, Rwandan colleagues that I was working with until we were outside of the country across the border. And even then there was hesitancy. And even now there is still hesitancy, you know, and Claudine can speak to this more fully within the diaspora to speak about the you know the variables that go into you know what we might call a softer authoritarianism in the in the country um, and so i think getting that in-depth honesty you know there has to be the right conditions around it right most most rwandans in the right conditions who live in the country will you know freely acknowledge as you know the, the folks did in stella in the um, the group uh, discussion group you're in the you know the monitoring and the limitations on freedoms of speech and um and news media and so on social media and most will acknowledge that most will acknowledge that you know in your average college classroom university classroom there are you know folks there who are you know as a I guess as an aside, are there to inform the government if there is anything untoward that's said uh, within that classroom space, as an example. And so most have an awareness of that control, but like in other you know, contexts in, in other countries, right, you, you sort of are in this kind of um, social contract or this tacit agreement with the government that you, know, you may have access to development, employment, jobs, education for your children and so on. And so, you know, the bargain is that you, you will, you know, go along with the current order. Um, but however, right, you then, you know, that development and opportunity, access to opportunity in Rwanda, you know, doesn't stretch to all parts of the country. Right? There are still other uh, parts of Rwanda that are, you know, severely impoverished and, you know, very much firmly in the global south, you know, notwithstanding how much you know, Kigali is sort of positioned as this kind of global north haven um, within um, within Central Africa. So, yeah, I just wanted to add that, that, you know, there there are a lot of dynamics to being able to get, um, you know, all sides of the story, um, which take time, I think. Any other questions? Well, perhaps we can pose some of our own questions to each other. Sure. Do you want to start? Or do you want me to start? I can start. Yes. Okay. Um, I'd be interested for you to tell us a little bit more about um, just this comparative uh, perspective you had. And we're here to talk a little bit about transnational issues. Um, so the comparative perspective that you found when talking to Rwandans in the diaspora and, and Bosnians to sort of bring in a bit of a, an outside element to the, the strict framing of our topic. Um, what were some of the, the interesting similarities and differences that you found when you know, comparing these two experiences? Sure. Um, so in terms of similarity, uh, we 
obviously know that Rwandan genocide and the Bosnian civil war slash genocide kind of happened around the same time. Similar dynamics took place in both countries and similar dynamics in post-genocide took place in, ter in terms of the ICTR, ICTY, and um, prosecuting people who had committed genocide. Um, so some of the similarity really kind of were tied to narrative and identities in the sense of both groups had strong narrative of genocide slash post-genocide identities, right? In the sense of the, the younger generations were experiencing the same dynamic. So Hutus and Bosnian Serbs who were the perpetrators had similar understanding of what had happened, uh, took similar actions in terms of coping mechanism or even just like denying um, the, the, the history in the sense of they just deny the fact that they were Rwandan or they were Bosnian and then try to integrate fully into the different society. Um, and they had very similar trauma in the sense of not being recognized as victims, not being acknowledged as people who had suffered and having to, in some ways, justify the actions of the few or some of the people who committed genocide um, because of the ethnic identity. The same happened within the, the Bosniaks and the Tutsis who were the victims. They had exactly, or not exactly, but they have very similar narrative of identity and the same between the Bosnian Croat and the, the Tkwa. So the, the narrative between both ethnic, uh, between both countries were extremely similar if you were to divide them based on those labels of victim and perpetration. And the, the coping mechanism were extremely similar. Um, the, the main interesting thing I found were how they were dealing with it in the sense of you did have Hutus who promoted that dual genocide narrative in the sense of they were like, yes, a genocide happened in Rwanda against Tutsi, but also a genocide happened against Hutu. And that was kind of promoting not just the genocide itself, the 1994 April to July uh, genocide, but also the aftermath, like the RPF engaged into revenge killing after when it took power and doing the, the genocide itself. They engaged into um, hunting Rwandans, especially Hutus in the DRC camps in different places uh, for a long time. So you did have Hutus who had survived those um, those uh, killings that were promoting this dual genocide. Um, and in terms of the Bosnians, uh, you did have Bosnians uh, Serbs who were saying, yes, but the Croats or the Bosniak, Bosniak Muslim also killed us and we were defending ourselves. So you had that kind of complexity of acknowledgement and in some ways complexity of denying. Um, both groups had. And one interesting thing that's different, I think, when it comes to both groups is the fact that for Bosnian Serbs, um, it was extremely interesting. I remember talking to someone who was telling me that every time he goes back home, he goes to these specific cities. And those cities are in Bosnia, but he mentioned them as being Serbs, as being in Serbia. So it was interesting because if you know the history of Bosnia, they kind of divided Bosnia into like two different regional uh, after the genocide. Um, so the Bosnian Serb were talking about cities that were in Bosnia, but they were referring to them as Serbian or as in Serbia. So it was kind of interesting to see that, that construction of narrative and identity um, that was not there for Rwandans because the narrative that was there for Rwandans was a narrative of that they go back home when they feel like it, when they can, but it is how they understand going back home. Um, so those were some of the remarks and interesting things um, I found that was fascinating for me as a researcher. <laughs> I hope that answered the question. Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I have a question for you, actually, if you don't mm. mind. So I um, 
we've been in the U.S. We've been grappling with this idea of like masculinity and toxic masculinity in a lot of different ways, and it looks very differently. And as someone who has done research looking at uh, Benyamulenge, who were soldiers, like active combatants doing the the both wars in in DRC. Um, I would love for you to kind of talk about toxic masculinity in a way to compare it to maybe our current understanding of it when we look at it in the West versus what it actually looks like and feels like for soldiers in East Africa. Yeah, that's a, a really good question. So I, the, the phrase that I've used in some of my work is this idea of violent masculinity. And there's a lot of caveats around this, right? That obviously not all masculinities are violent, right? And, you know, there are, um, you know, femininities that are violent as well, if we were to, you know, to, to flip that the other way around. However, there are in many societies, these dominant um, patriarchal sort of masculine drives to use violence as, an assess as a necessity to assert identity and performance, right, and sort of ownership and control over circumstances which certain narratives would cast as being sort of beyond their control, right, and so we certainly could see that in, you know, take, for example, the, um, the January attacks on the, uh, on the U.S. Uh, state, on the, uh, on the Congress building, <laughs> As a British person, sometimes these terms escape me, right? So, yeah, so the, the January 7th attacks, right? We saw like a very strong, um, you know, you could look at that through a, a violent masculine lens, right? And so, you know, we often then lean on this terminology of, of toxic masculinities. Um, and, and and that has some validity, but I think uh, has it needs to be critically engaged with. So in, in my work, looking particularly in the region and, you know, the very narrow case of Banya Malenge soldiers, I saw as a theme within my research, uh, how gender roles were shaped and then transformed in the process of becoming uh, more involved in armed conflict. So sort of at a, I guess, as a resting position, uh, Banya Malenge culture, like many other cultures in, um, in Eastern Congo, but then also in Rwanda and Burundi, uh, associated um, cattle ownership and cultivation and transhumanence with sort of coming of age for young boys, right? That you helped your father, your uncles, and so on to tend the herd and to look after them as a source of wealth, as a source of sort of symbolic culture and um, a meaning, right? And so when the RPF then came along, uh, it in many ways transformed these ways of becoming a man uh, to becoming more militarized, right? So the opportunities that and uh, education and you know, future employment that were provided by traditional ways of life in the early 1990s, because of the context of what was happening in Zaire um, at the time, became less and less appealing. And so when the RPF showed up in a very timely manner with alternatives that you could become a man by joining us and fighting to protect our ethnic group across borders was the pitch, if you will. And so these young boys, 18, 19, early twenties became men in this alternative way with uncles, grandfathers supporting them who were a part of the RPF support network in the late eighties and early nineties. And so we see this mobilization of masculinity uh, away from these you know, traditional ways of life and not to put a, sort of put them in a neutral box, but that we can call them traditional all the same um, to this sort of RPF administered um, coming of age, right? And this was then repeated in another cycle of recruitment in the uh, in 1996, as the first Congo war began with the uh, Rwandan led invasion. And so what I've tried to document then is this mobilization of, of masculinity as violent masculinities, but then also as this necessity, right, that um, we have this kind of coming together of the way of becoming a man and the way of protecting your community is by fighting to preserve that community. And that's something that is a, a theme for many in the Banya Malenga diaspora today, whether you're here in the US or Kenya, or Rwanda or um, other parts of um, Central Africa or even in Europe as well. And so this expression of masculinity you know, became sort of mobilized by the RPF and has persisted ever since. 
Uh, and so uh, members of Banya Malenge uh, militia groups or community or communal self-defense groups, as they would prefer to be uh, labeled, uh, continue to mobilize that. And so almost as a, uh, a rhyme, a rhyming of history, you have in parts of South Kivu today where schools are shut down because you know, they can't function because of this back and forth between rebel groups, um, school kids, young boys, almost exclusively find their way into these armed groups as a way of becoming men that's expected of their community where other opportunities and traditional pathways for doing so are um, sort of either neutered or extinguished or displaced from them. So I think that coming back to your question, there are some interesting parallels, but some differences, I think. And I think one of the parallels certainly is you can see from the US context to you know, many places in Africa and even other parts of the world where you know, previous involvement in violence and masculinity and violence uh, are sort of in a nexus together, right? So if I'm a former soldier and my experience and my livelihood has been based off of that, I'm more likely to get back into that gig as a way of finding meaning and survival. And you know, we could say the same about you know, former police and military uh, officers here in the US who have become part of militia movements and were indeed present uh, on January 7th in DC. Thank you. I would like to talk about positionality a little bit and then we'll see if we have additional questions. Um, so I know what it feels like to be a Rwandan researching Rwandans. I know, I know the joy and I know the danger that comes with that and the, the, the dilemma I kind of have to encounter when that happens. Uh, but I would love to know then how you kind of grapple with those researching um, as a British also, <laughs> like UK does not have a, a happy, uh, let's say, uh, story slash narrative when it comes to that specific region. Like Tony Blair is not necessarily the most liked person. Let's just say that. But I would like to hear more about your own positionality in the research you conduct, especially talking and researching child soldiers, people who have committed atrocities in a lot of different ways and trying to be as objective and telling these stories? Yeah, this is a really challenging question. And I, you know, I've thought about this and you know, said something about it in previous uh, forums. Um, I've you know, blogged about this personally. And I think it's, it's something worth considering, but, um, and I, I certainly will answer your question, but I think sometimes the, the least helpful thing is for us to hear more from white researchers about how they position themselves, but I certainly will <laughs> um, will address that, right? So, um, and, it's, and certainly it's not about me, it's about this relational context, right? Where privilege uh, interacts um, and, and power is uh, quite tangible. And so, you know, as many other researchers of, you know, with combatants, particularly those who've been involved in mass violence and atrocity, will will say that, you know, they're, participants in their research, you know, don't talk openly, but speak in coded ways about violence that they've engaged in in the past. Uh, and a really good example of this is, you know, for those of who are, are here today, if you're familiar with the country context, you might have read uh, Jason Stern's work, uh, Dancing in the Glory of Monsters, which had a recent follow up earlier this year. Uh, he, you know, gives, uh, brings this to life a little bit more. But in, in my own work, I've found that yes, uh, people will talk about it in coded ways that don't directly implicate themselves, but do say something about participation, right? And the why, right? And the justifications. And again, this idea of necessity of uh, self-defense sort of overlapping and merging with uh, committing mass atrocities. And this isn't something that's unique to Congo or Rwanda. We can see this across cases, right? And again, it's coming back to that narrative. Um, and so, you know, I found that, um, you know, one common thing, I guess, to say that, that I found with participants as I've talked to them is that they, you know, in terms of this objectivity, right, I remember this one, uh, one person who was sort of a veteran of, of multiple uh, armed movements, but also had been a long standing member of the Congolese Armed Forces. And again, demonstrating this sort of back and forth between armed forces and rebel groups that's a frequent uh, fixture in the Congo. Um, 
said to me that, you know, well, he was going to tell me the absolute truth, right? And what other people were going to say to him was, mm, you know, probably not the right story, but he was going to tell me the absolute truth, right? And so I think maybe culturally, but then also um, in other senses, right, there is this objectivity that's presented that is uh, immediate and uh, in very important to all the participants that I speak to, right? And so that then, right, that objectivity needs to be considered in this uh, relational context, right? And they're presenting to me a story that they want me to hear. And I've you know, heard this from many participants because they, there is the sense that as a white um, person that you will then be able to go and you know, raise uh, this victimhood narrative to you know, people who can do something about it which has some irony, of course, because you know, you know, a lot of folks will want you to sort of invoke the story to the UN or to government leaders um, when we know that you know, the mission in the UN, the UN mission in the Congo has not been as successful as hoped and has been extremely expensive and increasingly under criticism from you know, various elements of Congolese society. And so there's some tragic irony perhaps there. So anyway, just I guess just to say is that I there is there is a challenge there, right? And a lot of that as a researcher, when it comes down to methods, is about you know triangulating information, understanding um, you know the, the nitty gritty details of you know people and places and events and so on, but then allowing subjectivity to enter into your analysis, which some perhaps are uncomfortable with. Um, perhaps many of our political science colleagues are you know this is troubling. But I, I think it's it's really important, right? We have to embrace the subjectivity, uh, even when you know participants are presenting what they would uh, say as you know subjective truth, right? Hard truth. And so something that's been crucial to me is having this relational perspective, thinking about how people relate to structures and environments that they co-create uh, with other actors, and thinking about the the subject native subjective nature of that co-construction. you um anyone has any questions Susan hi yeah thank you thank you for this um I uh appreciate that yeah lots lots of lots of thoughts going spinning around in my head now um from from your conversation I wanted to um to, to note we we have just about 20 minutes left um so for others who have questions now is the time to ask them um, but my question, I wanted to note that I think we have quite a few students in, in the um, Zoom room here. And so do you have advice for students who, who are studying these issues? Um, and I guess in terms of um, the sustainability of your engagement with this and, and the ethics of, of your engagement and the, um, yeah, the questions around positionality that you've already touched on, but, but to, to, to turn the, the advice towards students. And, and for either of you or both of you to weigh in there. I'd certainly have a quick comment and then I'd, I'd be more interested to hear what Claudine would have to say, right? Because I think you have a really important perspective as, as a, sort of a, a layered participant, if you will, right? Uh, you know, being a member of, of a diaspora that you research, I think there's some right, valuable um, things to say there. But I would just say briefly in terms of sustainability and positionality, um, that social media is a really interesting um, bridge into a lot of these uh, conflicts and narratives, but one would have to be cautious, right, in using that as a, um, a single source, right, and it com coming back to, again, this thing about triangulation and reading uh, news sources, right, if you wanted to understand a little bit more, not fully, right, but a little bit more about what's going on in either of these countries, particularly in Congo, it's so important to engage with you know, foreign language sources or non-English sources, um, you know, news sources, and you know, and developing contacts and conversations, right? If you're perhaps a student's looking to do field work in either of these places, um, you know, social media is a great bridge to meeting people, um, you know, virtually before perhaps meeting them in person. Um, so there's a few resources and tools out there, and I think a lot of it should orient around getting a diverse selection of information about a, a place that you'd like to go and do research in or to know more about, but then also finding sort of a balance of information too. Thank you. 
that was my brief comment. Uh, that's a that's a tough question for me in the sense of I do research my own community in a lot of different ways, and um, the question around positionality is a very hard question for me to kind of navigate. So that's why I kind of wanted to hear uh, more how kind of um, how Chris grappled with that question. Um, in terms of advice, um, when you're working in is Eastern Africa, or like when you're working in different countries, what you want to do is make sure that you you explore the different stories. Like I'm a huge story person. Um, we'll we'll all in a lot of ways get the stories we're hearing from people. Um, either if in the, in the case of Rwanda, people that were there by the, the Rwandan government in the diaspora, the stories will be completely different. So, what are the different complexity? available within that specific conflict. And I think that ties to uh, what Chris also researched and mentioned, like the, the impact of Rwandan genocide is, has been felt everywhere, but we often get the same story over and over again. Uh, and as a researcher, it is our responsibility to make sure that we understand the full picture. Like we looked at the complexity and those complexity in a lot of ways kind of break down the simple narrative and then allow us to understand the real the, the real conflict like a simple narrative is what leads to conflict most of the time so how can you break that simple narrative into complexity so i always encourage my students to not look at just the surface but what's the surface hiding um and I think if you're researching Rwanda, the first thing you want to make sure is you are safe, both physically and emotionally. As a Rwandan, <laughs> it is extremely hard to research Rwanda, like emotionally is extremely hard. So um, I, I always recommend my students to be physically and emotionally safe when you're doing your research. Find a way to make sure that you are contributing to the broader conversation, but your contribution does not lead you to 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 be jaded or to be um like emotionally not available for the things you want to do later on um and most importantly i think learn which methodology works best for you um and if you take research methods you will be exposed to a lot of different things but find which one will be best for you for the type of research you want to conduct and which one will allow you to get the answers you're looking for. I think that's like the big general <laughs> advice. If you need more advice, just send, send me an email and then we'll go from there. <laughs> Any other question? Sorry, I, yeah, ahead, Chris. I, oh, I was just gonna say, I think both of us would be happy to, you know, you know obviously we have different areas of, of interest. So if you feel like one of us is more applicable than the other, you know, please do get in touch with us. There was a question on here about the Dusla report. Um, I'll just read it back out here. Um, this is from Matthew. He says, uh, what are your comments on the Dusla report issued by French investigators and historians uh, that confirms French authorities part of responsibility in the London genocide? Um, I don't know, Claudine, if you want to speak to this one. Sure. Um, that's, that's, that's a hard one. <laughs> Um, I don't even know how to actually address this question. Um, in terms of the, the, who's responsible for the Rwandan genocide, uh, French being responsible, Belgians being responsible, CIA being responsible, um, there are a lot of blames that are going around, especially when it comes to what exactly are you talking about? Are you talking about the weapons? that were brought to Rwanda by several international countries? Are you talking about the sponsorship given to the RPF? Are you talking about the negotiations that happened prior to the genocide that were extremely single-sided and that were in a lot of ways undermining the Rwandan government negotiator and sit at the table? Um, you, we do have several countries that in some ways indirectly apologize for their own responsibilities. Uh, we do have several countries, including France, that in some ways acknowledge that they could have done more. Um, but again, 
the blame was put on the actual perpetrators in, in terms of those who actively physically participated. Um, and that has created a ripple effect on the Rwandan as a bigger, broader community. Um, and the fact that you do have several countries who in some ways acknowledge that something could have been done and in some ways they had some stability on it, uh, in it is important. But I think in some ways that does not answer the real questions we have when we're looking at Rwanda and the Rwandan genocide. Um, Matthew, you and I, we can have another conversation about that that is a little bit more detailed. And I'd just add as well, um, you know, obviously the report, you know, adds to the historical record about what happened in, in, in various ways, right? Um, and does, you know, get into the dynamics of uh, responsibility and, and so on. I think that's really important. But I think for me, additionally, and I, for many others as well, you know, the timing and the, um, the, uh, the political aspects and diplomatic aspects of the report are equally important for us to consider, right? It's not just what the report says directly, but it's what the, uh, you know, the delivery of the report says about relations between France and Rwanda. And in many ways, this victory of the, the RPF's um, foreign policy and diplomacy and their reliance on this, the narrative, right? And so I'm not, um, in, in this instance here, I'm not saying that they're wrong per se, but I'm just observing here the power of the narrative in bringing foreign governments in line with what they have to say. And so I think this is something really important here. And so what then, you know, the again, right, the ricochets of this is that, you know, when Rwanda says, to come back to Congo, right, when Rwanda says, well, the Congolese are killing themselves, right, we're not responsible for that, right? foreign governments will buy into you know rwandan uh, responses because of the strength of their narrative and how it's then reinforced by you know the the moves by the french government to support it right i think we had a question from obi and i just want to add something oh. very fast um and i think one thing we need to in some ways acknowledge is that um the destabilization of the rule the, the genocide led to a lot of ripple effects, not just in terms of people dying, but also in terms of destabilizing the whole region. And having the Rwandan government as powerful as it is in a lot of ways and having the DRC as corrupt, you can use whatever, whatever adjective you want after that, in some ways it's beneficial to us. We all have iPhones. We all love our phones. We all love our computers and stuff like that. So in a lot of ways, there was a bigger geopolitical um, game that we need to be aware of. Um, Rwanda has no natural resources, but we sell billions worth of cobalt every year. That is, there's a bigger conversation than just the narrative of identities and how those narratives were able to be weaponized by Rwanda, but also by other governments um, that in some ways we need to acknowledge when we have a conversation like this. Um, sorry, Obi, you have a question. Yes, thank you so much, Claudine and Chris. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, my name is Obi, I'm from Nigeria. I love this conversation. And uh, I want to just let us know that sometime in 70s, you know, um, there was a civil war in Nigeria. It was, uh, there was also a genocide. Uh, but my question is this. Um, Claudine, you said there is no freedom of, if, um, f uh, uh, there is no freedom of expression in Rwanda. There is, uh, maybe I want to say that there is also no, a, a kind of people-centered democracy. Uh, how, how, how is the future assured for, for young people, and women specifically, uh, because um, from my experience of what happened here in Nigeria some years back, after 50 years of you know further suppression and marginalization, the you know, young people began you know, actually regrouped and started a new style of um, agitations, you know, using social media, and it's very very hot. It's 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 causing tensions in Nigeria. 
you know. So I want to know what, how is this um, the future secured, you know, with this all these experiences for young people, and also not repeating the same thing again that happened sometime in nineties, and also for women. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. Uh, several things. Um, Rwanda is not a state with a military. Rwanda is a military within a state in the sense of the way the Rwandan government deal with anything is through military tactics. Um, so that in some ways limits freedom of expression, assembly, whatever first amendment we have in this country is not really, is not available in Rwanda. So when it comes to uh, young people, the Rwandan diaspora has been extremely good at mobilizing and creating uh, the momentum a lot of Rwandans in the country can't physically do. And those who have tried have in a lot of ways disappeared. Um, that is what we are currently observing. Like we literally have um, a group of activists both in Rwanda and abroad who are following all the disappearing and all the things that happened. And that is called Rwandan's Life Matter. Like you literally can go and like follow and see what's happening, who is disappearing, why, and all the things are happening, right? So the Rwandan diaspora community, especially in Europe, has been extremely um, influential in creating then that, hey, if something needs to happen, let's make sure that we keep track and record all those things. Um, and they have a lot of platform and they can do that, right? In terms of women, um, we have about 60% of the parliament um, that is women right now in Rwanda, uh, which we've been praised for it, which is extremely performative in a sense of they, are, they have the seat, but they have no power because at the end of the day, President Kagame is the one who has the power to pretty much veto and do whatever he wants. So a lot of the actions Rwanda is praised for are extremely performative and they are performative because we need uh, humanitarian aid because we need all those money to be pumped in the country to be the new African Singapore. Oh, um, as Rwandans, I have opinions about a lot of things. So, <laughs> so I need to kind of sometimes filter myself. But um, the, the women in Rwanda, in, the, in a lot of sense, especially in the government, do not have the power we think they do. Um, and the most of the work in Rwanda has been done in diaspora. Like we do have several women who are, um, who are extremely influential, uh, such as um, Victoire Ingabir. But she grew up, she, she was in the diaspora for like years, for over a decade, and then moved back to Rwanda to be, to, to be a candidate for president. She ended up in prison for over 10 years. And then when she came out, she had such a big follower internationally that they can't really touch her uh, without really being in trouble. Um, so going back to your question, in some ways making parallel with Nigeria, a lot of the work that are done in Ru for Rwanda in terms of like bring Rwanda to a more just slash democratic is done in, in diaspora and is not physically capable, uh, is not physically um, done in Rwanda because of how militarized the government is. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the conversation. I am very sorry to see we have just four minutes left because we need to end at 1020, but I wanted to ask if you could each briefly speak to you know, any future directions of your work in this area, um, as well as any concluding comments you'd like to make as we conclude this session. Thank you. Sure. Uh, something that's really important for me, uh, particularly in the Congolese context, which overlaps with the Rwandan and the Burundian one as well, uh, is developing more sort of shared stories and narratives about the past as a way of or as a, a piece of the puzzle of, of reconciliation and peace building in the region and right? you can't in the long term have robust peace uh, and even development of democracy in one of these countries without the other not least because of rebel groups that overlap and go back and forth but also because of a shared past that is largely unaddressed so uh, whilst I've been doing work on this uh, Gutumba massacre that I've mentioned, and we at Clark University have a digital commons collection of survivor accounts that 
that we've been collecting over the last couple of years. Um, I'm, I'm looking and interested to see the collection of, of other stories and accounts of massacre and thinking about how they've impacted communities in the long run, both those who um, were impacted directly by the violence, but then also the communities in which they were carried, in which these attacks were carried out. And so the future direction, future direction for my research would be um, thinking about you know, broadly meshing together and looking at more uh, in depth and having so trying to facilitate uh, community conversations between groups on this shared past, which is largely undressed. Um, for me, I have kind of two different places I'm going right now. Uh, one of them is taking a step back. Um, in December of last year, um, the Truth Reconciliation Commission in Burundi actually acknowledged that the 1972 massacres in Burundi were genocide against, were labeled genocide against Hutus. Um, so that is actually the first acknowledged genocide in Eastern Africa um, after colonialism and way before the Rwanda genocide. Um, so I'm taking kind of a shift here, looking at what that meant. If you had a genocide 15, years, 15 to 20 years before the Rwanda genocide, what does that mean? for the creation of identities and narrative that in some ways maybe al allow the excuse, allow some Rwandans to have an excuse to justify some of the action they took. So I'm kind of looking at that. The other one is kind of going back to the diaspora communities and looking at the second and third generations and how in some ways they understand what it means to be Rwandans, they do, do, they do not speak the language. They don't practice the culture. Like what does, what does being Rwandan means if you don't have that cultural linguistic attachment to your country and how in some ways do you position yourself within this bigger conversation of human rights and democracy in your own country? Well, thank you both. I um, I would love to have another session with you, maybe maybe next year's Fall Peace Week, uh, to see to see how this develops um, in the future. But thank you both for sharing um, your your expertise. Uh, I see there's there's uh, thanks in the in the um, chat room. I'm going to place in the chat also the the link to other Peace Week events. You all have given us a fabulous start to Peace Week. We have um, another event starting in ten minutes. Um, and and throughout the week, many many sessions um, scheduled. But thank you so much for for your time, sharing your expertise, and um, uh, getting us off to a great start. Thanks, Susan. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. Mm -hmm. And great thanks for your questions, you everyone. <laughs> bye bye.